Welcome, everybody. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this session of uh, meeting our CEO leaders, otherwise known as 40 with Foreman. And the 40 is about how long I plan to, uh, uh, to speak to our guests, and then we'll open it up for uh, another 15 or 20 minutes uh, to some conversation with uh, some of you who are on the, the call. Uh, this is a, uh, a slightly different format uh, and event than the ones we've been running the last few years, uh, the flat last few months. Um, usually it's been a single uh, organizational leader. A couple of times we've had two people on the call because they were of the same organization. But this is the first time we've tried having uh, a generational uh, presentation with three members of the same family, three generations of the same family, all connected somehow with business, but all focusing on different aspects of the ventures, of their venture. So we've got Jim, Jimmy, and Ryan Bristol. Ryan is on our board, the youngest of the three. Ryan, you would be what now, the sixth generation in the business or fifth? Fifth, let's not jump the gun there, but uh, okay. <laughs> we do have a sixth generation that may be on board in uh, 18 years or so, but um, we, we, I, I'm the eldest of the fifth generation. Okay, and we appreciate your, your service on the board. But uh, J.F. Price, Bristol uh, uh, Brothers, a storied history on the South Shore, uh, and it goes back to the turn of the century. And I'm not talking the turn of the 21st century. It goes back to the turn of the 20th century back in late 1890s, early 1900s. Let me turn it over to the patriarch of the family. Jim, tell us a little bit about how it all got started and uh, with your, uh, geez, it would be your father-in-law and grandfather-in-law, I believe. But tell us how it all got started. Okay, well, that's that's uh, uh, a start, Peter. We uh, um, started in uh, 1953, and uh, I had just graduated from UMass Amherst. I went there because there was nothing else to do, and you could go for 50 bucks a semester at the time. <laughs> so uh, we we probably got the cheapest education. At any rate, uh, I was waiting to go into the Air Force. Uh, I was in the ROTC program during the Korean War, and uh, it, the war ended, and so they put off my time. And I was just kind of hanging around my... Uh, I guess a girlfriend, fiance, <laughs> and uh, her father didn't like to see a guy hanging around. So he said, well, why don't you go over to the quarry and work until you go in the Air Force? That said, a year later, <laughs> I was still working in the quarry, but then went in the Air Force after we were, we were, uh, we were married that uh, uh, winter. At any rate, Returning from the Air Force, uh, I decided to uh, uh, help out with the, the family business. There were no other boys in the family. Uh, my wife had two sisters. So uh, we went over the, over to, from Quincy to Weymouth and uh, started uh, working with the with all the quarrymen when they saw this young kid with his butch haircut and uh, they, uh, you know, didn't hold much uh, faith in anything I could do, but uh, uh, we uh, plugged along and uh, uh, got to know how to do all those things. Uh, when I first went over there, there was a wooden derrick and uh, chains hanging down from it that you'd lift things with. That was it. 
there were no forklifts, there were no excavators, there were there were no nothing. <laughs> and uh, at least we had compressed air. Yeah. But well, maybe let him know how uh, Randy and his dad got started. Yeah. Um, uh, the company was Bates Brothers, and uh, it was uh, started by my wife's father, Russell, his brother, Earl, and their father, Gustav uh, Bates. Uh, going way back into the teens, as you did, Gustav was the mayor of Quincy uh, for a time. It was probably uh, just before, or during World War I. And uh, uh, so they carried on. They incorporated in 1920. That's why we were having our 100th year uh, in 2020 and uh, um, continued to uh, quarry stone. There were many quarries in Weymouth at that time. There were five or four or five uh, good sized ones doing many uh, buildings that you'd recognize. We still continue. We're doing one right now, Boston College, uh, Yale University. Uh, Many in New York, we actually had a salesman in New York at the time. They were doing so much work down there. So at any rate, uh, and the, uh, all the, uh, when I went over to the quarry myself and, uh, you know, started talking with some of the guys, um, most people think that the granite workers are all Italian. These were, uh, these <laughs> happens once a meeting. <laughs> Just a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most of them were, uh, uh, most people thought the uh, stone workers were Italian. We were all uh, uh, Swedish and uh, Finnish immigrants. And you might say, because most of them were first generation coming over to this country as stone cutters. But stone cutter was a very uh, respected craftsman in their time. Well, time went on and uh, we uh, actually joined together uh, in about the 30s with the, the four or five quarries that were in the uh, Weymouth Hingham area and formed the sales company so that the uh, Weymouth granite could be marketed uh, around the East Coast and as, as it was. And then uh, we got into the Depression and things slowed down seriously. And then World War II, when all the quarries were shut down. So uh, when I arrived on the scene uh, in the early 50s, uh, we had just, well, been four or five years into uh, uh, opening up the quarries again and uh, doing a lot of the stonework that uh, we have done in the last 50, 60 years. Um, as we went forward, I was a, a uh, what do I want to say? I, I, I enjoyed uh, the use of machinery and we gradually, we got a, uh, a backhoe and a, a forklift and things of that sort. And uh, um, that continued uh, to help us. As we moved along uh, 10, 12 years later, our neighbors, the uh, Price family, uh, even though they had, there were two brothers, even though they had two uh, or they actually have five uh, sons uh, in their family. Nobody was interested in digging dirt, so uh, uh, they wanted to sell their land and their their business. And uh, it's funny. Remember at the time I went to my Mary's dad. I said, "Geez, we really ought to buy their land that's right next to to ours." And uh, his answer was. Well, you can buy it if you want. I gave it to him. <laughs> so uh, at that 
that's what we finally worked out. We uh, bought the price land and at the time thought maybe we might be developing it. We were doing a lot of work with uh, uh, Jack Lamborghini. If some of you guys remember me, built the Weymouth Industrial Park and uh, uh, Weymouth Port and uh, Buzzy Schofield, the two of them. And uh, we uh, um, bought the land thinking we would do something with it. And a year later, we hadn't done a thing. And uh, the prices uh, kind of offered me a, a, a proposition, I guess you would say, to buy their business and their sand and gravel plant, uh, you know, a nickel a down and a quarter a week. And uh, so that's what we did. That's how we get into the sand and gravel business. We bought that from the Price family. And uh, uh, that continued on as we as we do, as we did uh, uh, the sand and gravel for quite a few years. And uh, then in the uh, early 80s, I would say, um, we were doing the uh, concrete, concrete work. Uh, uh, Marshfield Santa Gravel was doing the concrete work for Weymouth Port and decided they would set up, or we allowed them to set up a little crushing plant to um, make the uh, aggregate for the concrete. And uh, as that went on, uh, when that was over, uh, they uh, had to uh, abandon that plant. And uh, that's when we started uh, uh, the uh, other business that were in the Russo Bristol. That was 40 years ago, uh, crushing the granite as well as cutting it. And uh, so that continues. And uh, we acquired some land at that time from Plymouth Quarries. And, and uh, um, went forward with that part of our, our business. Uh, we continue to uh, um, cut granite for building stone. And we went from cutting it all by hand to uh, the way it's done today. We have saws. We saw the granite into slabs. It goes through. Uh, a, a big hydraulic splitter that uh, brings it down to block size. And now the uh, latest innovation with stone is to do thin stone. And we have a uh, line set up where we just take the skin off the, if you will, off the stone about an inch thick. And uh, that's called thin stone. And uh, they almost, uh, they install that on buildings and it looks just like uh, uh, it were full bed, six or eight inch thick pieces of granite. Uh, then we recently um, uh, made a uh, arrangement with Plymouth Quarries. We took, we've taken that over. They too had nobody in there family that wanted to uh, dig dirt or cut stone. So uh, I guess I got to say Bates Brothers Granite Company is the final survivor after uh, over 100 years. And uh, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, we've got uh, several generations of our family continuing. Uh, we, sitting here with me are my son Jim, my son Dave, and uh, uh, some, uh, some of our uh, daughters, uh, Amy and Janet, uh, help out with uh, that generation. And uh, now um, we have uh, uh, grandchildren. Uh, Ryan, uh, what happened to Ryan? He was here. <laughs> um, here he, here he is back. Ryan is here, and uh, 
uh, his two brothers, uh, Steve and Jake, and uh, also we have uh, two other uh, grandchildren, uh, Heather uh, Quintel, Amy Webb's daughter, and uh, Curtis Webb. And uh, they're all very uh, active in our business. Uh, so much for the quarry and the stone business. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we're doing site work for other people and uh, building roads and so forth. And finally, my son Jim came to me one day and he says, you know, uh, we're as smart as most of these dopes we're working for. Why don't why don't we build the roads? <laughs> and uh, uh, out of that conversation started our development about 30 years ago. As you're as you're interested, uh, or as you uh, witnessed, I guess you got to say we we. I'll let Jim and uh, Ryan jump in at this point, but they can. Uh, Tell you some of the projects we've done. They've all been fun. The, the the one I guess we're most proud of at this point in time is the weather vane uh, golf course and uh, um, housing um, that's up in South Weymouth. It's uh, um, been uh, a lot of fun building it. A lot of fun keeping it up. A lot of fun trying to uh, keep up with all the the regulations about the um, the lands, the frogs, the <laughs> everything involved, uh, and I think we've done pretty well with that. So, uh, with that, Peter, I think that brings you up to date. And my time ought to be up. Hey, P Peter, real quick, I'm um, I'm just. Doing a smooth transition to a different laptop here. We're having some issues with the one we're on, but I'm ready to join from the other one. We'll, we'll see how smooth it is. All right. <laughs> okay. Get you in. So whoever's gonna let us in should be okay. There we are. You're still on, so that works. No, oh, no. Oh, let's see. Where'd you disappear to? How smooth was it? Okay. Um, I trying to find you. I can hear you. I can, we have so many people. Oh, there you are. Got it. Find you. Can you see us? Yep. I, uh, okay. And hear us too. Yeah, the sound is a little uh, spotty here. Okay. Did that fix the sound at all? Uh, no, actually, the sound was better on the first one. No, that that's that isn't working at all. Nope, we're st still underwater gurgling. Okay, did we, are they dialing, are they reconnecting? Looking for them. I've got uh, two Bristol connections that are. Yeah, I think the other one is from prior. 
I see three here. I'm going to remove that for a second. Hmm. All right, uh, let me just check my email, see if I'm getting any SOS from them. There they are. Okay, you're back. Do we have sound with you? How about now? There you go. Excellent. Oh, about that <laughs> we're better at quarry and stone <laughs> yeah but the, the the family grew while you were away who who's the fourth person he's the uh he's he, he's in our computer department so ah. I see. <laughs> that, that's, okay. that's that's dave uh he's part of the fourth generation him, him and my father are hey dave, how are you so jim the first time i met you about uh 17 years ago with a big, big smile on your face, you said you can sell the ground by the pound or by the inch. <laughs> so I, I gather Jimmy's the one who's been selling it more by the inch uh, with the driveway and the real estate. Uh, Jimmy, tell, tell us a little bit about the, um, the real estate development. Yeah, well, um, as exciting as that quarry in history sounded, I got a little bored um, and started to venture out. When I got out of college, um, my roommate Dave Erickson and I, who grew up in Weymouth with me, worked at the quarries as a watchman as a kid, uh, started doing outside site work, building roads and um, doing site work for other developers. Um, I think I referred to them as blokes. My father quoted me as dopes earlier. <laughs> um, <laughs> we we uh, <laughs> we had some opportunities in the late '80s, early '90s to start doing some development of our own. Uh, we liked the idea because, as we had gotten into the site work business, we were quite often competing with. Uh, customers of ours in the quarry business. So to be able to do our own development and get it to the point now where we probably 99% of our outside site work, uh, road construction site development is on real estate development projects that we are uh, the developer. So um, I used to do the estimating, I didn't enjoy it. And uh, by taking on development, we got every one of those jobs uh, whether we were the high bidder, low bidder, or where we were supposed to be. So um, we, we've built hundreds of homes now and developed uh, hundreds more units on the South Shore. Uh, we've pretty much got a project in every town up and down the South Shore from uh, Plymouth, Carver, Pembroke, uh, Norwell, Duxbury, um, Weymouth, Ingham, and as far out as uh, Walpole, we've got 100 units we're developing now out in Walpole. So it was kind of a natural to take uh, the equipment that we used in the quarry and grow it into the uh, excavation and site work and then the, the, the real estate development to kind of um, do everything soup to nuts. You know, we like to tell our guys when we go into a project, we're not, we're not done till we're mowing the lawn. So don't point at the, uh, the next contractor and say that's their job. <clears throat> get the thing done and uh, we know we're done when we're cutting the grass and, and then we keep doing that too. So, um, as my dad alluded to, our, our, probably our proudest project and most prominent is the weather vane uh, development with 150 units of 55 and over housing, nine hole golf course. And we uh, were fortunate enough to open a clubhouse five days before the pandemic hit. Uh, so <laughs> we had, 50 new employees all ready to go and uh, the rug got pulled out from under us. So we've uh, been able to survive. And uh, as the weather gets better and people discover this, this place, um, more and more uh, uh, 
enjoying it. Well, my wife and I were over in the fall out on the, uh, the patio at the clubhouse and the, the restaurant and uh, just before everything. Where you, well, you couldn't go anywhere, but uh, uh, out there in the just getting the the early piece of fall, uh, and uh, it was actually kind of busy. Everyone was masked up, but uh, it was busy, and the food was great, and a great setting out there, even at fall. So in the summer, uh, being I think out on that out on that patio uh, at the weather vane will be a very attractive option for, for area residents. So uh, housing products, very similar to what you've done at, at Weathervane, compact communities, uh, building more of that kind of lifestyle housing community that we think people are looking for, particularly a lot of the, uh, the downsize, baby boomers are downsizing, but uh, High quality, small lot, close neighborhood. Is that the concept with most of the development you're looking at around the South Shore? Yes, yeah, all, all those uh, towns that we're working on developments in are uh, exactly what you're saying, where we try to create some open space, concentrate the density of the development on, on a smaller parcel. Uh, it's less roads to build um, and you're able to as most developments go, builders have typically, historically, I should say, gone in and kind of cut lot line to lot line and used the entire parcel. We created a planned unit development concept in Weymouth where we were able to put all the housing on 30 acres and preserve as open space between the golf course and woods, 140 acres. Um, so a lot of the developments we're looking at, we just uh, acquired Pembroke Country Club and that will be our goal down there also to keep the 18 hole golf course uh, and maintain close to 200 acres of open space and get all the housing on about 40 acres down there. So, um, and similar, similar ideas in the other towns, they just don't all have golf courses. <laughs> That's great. So you were really half joking when you said you're not done till you're mowing the lawn and then you'll keep doing it. Ryan's taking it on, uh, the next generation's taking it into the service industry of, you're not done till they're in the house and you're feeding them and you're gonna keep feeding them. So R Ryan, take us now into the, the service end of the, uh, the, the family business. You're muted. There you go. I think I was muted. So, um... So as far as the service end, are you are you talking about the restaurant industry? Restaurants, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we um, obviously, like my father said, we have uh, we we opened up a week before the pandemic hit, and uh, so it's been a real struggle at the the clubhouse itself. But um, I, I don't particularly work in the service industry. Um, I'm I'm not. I I do more property management and um, the uh, real estate development aspect of things with my brother Jake. Uh, we kind of managed those tasks but um it is you know we were lucky enough to have a patio area and then the range bar and grill and hang them um we have so much outdoor space there where during a pandemic we, we were able to cater to uh the crowds that you know you, you wanted to be outside safe but still gather in, in, a, in a in an atmosphere that felt uh a little more lively than one's living room so uh we we were you know we were able to survive the pandemic we're looking forward to uh, th this year where hopefully things continue to uh, get better as time goes on and we're able to truly cater to the functions and all that stuff that we would like to host here. We're, we're at Weatherbane right now, so to host here in this building. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a fun journey. We just began about, was it four years ago at the range it would be at this point? So um, it's definitely something where we're still getting used to and uh, Will O'Connell is our partner in, in uh, both ventures that which at Weathervane and the range. And we're also going to bring him in on our team down in Pembroke as well. So um, he is one of the owners up at Granite Links uh, for reference there. And um, yeah, we're, we're excited to continue to grow that aspect of the business for sure. So there's there gotta be, we, we have a number of family businesses, um, uh, 
multi-generational businesses on the South Shore, not, not too many that hit the fifth generation. Um, that's pretty remarkable. Do you feel the pressure? Do you feel the pressure to build the empire and take it in new directions for another 50 years and two more generations? My dad's pinching me right now, so yeah. <laughs> but no, I um, we definitely, I'd say I can speak for all five of us in the fifth generation. Um, I know we, we ran through their names earlier, but my cousin Heather is our CFO. Uh, my brother Jake and I, like I said, we are uh, involved in the real estate and uh, I do property management as well. Uh, then there's my cousin Curtis Webb, who is uh, our, our construction manager. He's on site, you know, dealing with a lot of our ongoing uh, projects that we're building out ourselves. And then uh, my brother, Steven, is, uh, he, he works hand in hand with our golf pro. He's a very, very talented golfer. So there's a specific reason we put him into the golf industry. Um, but I would say we both feel, the, I mean, all, all five of us feel the pressure. Um, I think I, I know for all of us, it was kind of difficult at certain points in time to find where we fit in the business. Um, I think that you know, when you're the fifth generation trying to find your mold in, in, in a family business and upholding a reputation that's um, been going on for over 100 years now, it, it, it is a little, you know, stressful. And, and sometimes you may feel lost, you know, and I, I think at this point, all five of us have uh, really found where we fit in. And um, it's it's been a long journey. It started for me, I think I was about 12 years old after youth soccer. Um weighing trucks on a, a manual scale so it, was, it would be like the scale you step on at the gym and you slide the the, uh, the weights across and that's where it all started i'd be in my soccer gear so i guess i felt the pressure then too <laughs> so uh, is the family enterprise a democracy um or a uh, uh, a royalty where uh, the king has the final say we'll have to go back to the tapes on this one and see who got to speak the longest <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah we, we we uh we're very good at sitting down as a family and, and, and discussing everything that's going on uh pretty often it, it it is a democracy of sorts we we all have a say and that's i think the beauty of uh how, how a family business can grow when everyone respects each other's um you know, thoughts and contributions as, as if we are one big family. And I think family or not, that's how, you know, companies should work, you know. So in the fifth generation, all of you are involved in business somehow um, with, without necessarily telling me what the situation was. Were there cases where you or your siblings had a business idea and your father or grandfather said, that is a really stupid idea. You, you shouldn't do it. Huh, that's a good question. And were they right? It has to be business related? <laughs> yes. All right. Um, I don't, I can't think of one. I can't think of one. Yeah. Which is, I guess, yeah. a good answer. Are you insinuating we'd have a stupid idea? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just check it to see if you have. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like the democracy they have in Great Britain. They have a, a king and a queen who don't really have a thing to say. And uh, that's probably about the way it is here. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have a king and a queen, so we're lucky. Jimmy, how about you? Did you uh, take, did you take some... Uh, Business idea, you mentioned the driveways or build, doing the roads, but did you have other business ideas and your father just said, no, well, don't, don't. I came up with, um, my dad was always supportive. Um, and we've done a lot of projects where the economics in the end weren't as good as we thought going in. Um, you know, a lot of folks uh, will we'll get in front of boards, getting a project permitted in this ledge on the site. And they say, oh, well, you guys, you know, you can do that. That's that's what you do with uh, stone. And they don't realize that it costs us the same money as it would cost <laughs> anybody to drill and blast the stone. Um, but, 
we've, we've gotten good at finding good soils when we look at sites now and uh, almost every project we're working on now is uh, uh, has, the, has the bonus of having good soils that supports all the other entities. When we go into a development, everything we do um, either gets reused on the development itself or brought back to the quarry and, and sorted for, for uh, sale in the, in the JF Price and Plymouth Quarries world of selling earth products. So um, I'll have to say always gotten support um, and not always the best project. So um, it, it, that's when it's nice to have a family of uh, support. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest challenge, uh, running a business is a tough challenge. Passing it down from one generation to another or bringing different generations in is, is a whole nother set of challenges. Uh, many of those challenges or you, you just are able to work it all out around the, the kitchen table. Yeah, so this, this, with the next generation as Ryan alluded to, a lot of them were kind of finding their way uh, in, you know, we, we got the restaurant business, we've got the golf business, we've got the real estate development business, we've got house construction, um, we've got the quarry operation, uh, the sand and gravel loan. So everybody's started to find their niche in, in helping us grow the whole, uh, the whole global um, mission for, for the family. And, you know, that's, we look at any one of those components and look to grow it and make it better. And uh, they, they all support one another. So uh, it all helps. Peter, advice, uh, probably the only stage, stage advice that I've given to the children and grandchildren uh, through the ups and downs of economics, uh, don't forget how to dig dirt. And uh, they've all had their turn at it, and uh, some some are better than others. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, um, we we always have that so far to fall back on, and it's been very helpful. That's great, Brian. You joined our board two years ago or three years. What ago. What got you? Uh, what got you interested in becoming more involved in? Chamber and what are you getting out of it? So um, I believe the South Shore Leadership Program is a, a, a subsidiary of the Chamber somehow. I, I thought so, yeah. So no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a partnership with uh, South Shore Bank. It was a Jim Dunphy uh, brainstorm that he brought down from his work in the Chambers in New Hampshire and um, wanted to partner with us. We were out straight and he finally said, we'll do it. And you help market it. That's how yes. it came out. Well, that, I was a part of the, the pilot program there. So uh, Joe, Joe Grata, I think I saw him on this call too. He, and my cousin Heather, actually, I believe she's on it as well. Um, we were all a part of that program. And um, I think that was kind of the segue into, you know, being on the chamber board. Uh, they're, up, they're both obviously great programs for the South Shore. For, for me, what I'm getting out of the chamber board, first of all, is, um, you know, we, we obviously share the same 2030 vision as the chamber and the SSEDC. So, you know, to, 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 to be behind that and, you know, kind of push that, that, um, that plan out there that, you know, we, we do need more housing and, um, you know, we, 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 we are in the middle of a crisis as far as that is concerned. So that, that, it, that issue is something that we definitely can get behind. Um, and then during the pandemic, it was actually great to, to learn more about local businesses that were struggling, support those local businesses. I think the chamber did a good job of getting that word out. Um, so I was very you know, proud to, to see that happening for all of our local businesses that you know, were struggling at the time. So it, it, it's nice to you know, be a part of something that is promoting the South Shore in such a uh, positive manner. So you mentioned Joe Grada. <laughs> Uh, who is also in the leadership group with you. He's also on our board and on the call. Uh, Joe, a slightly similar story growing. Second generation family business and you've taken the business into a slightly different dimension. Um, 
your family operation running as smoothly as uh, the Bristols are claiming that their five generations have, have run? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, we have just the two of us, um, and that's just me and my father. So it's the two generations um, and, and just the two of us. My two, my two younger sisters did not participate in the business, although they appear to be beneficiaries uh, more frequently than I would have normally allowed. So um, other than that, though, um, yeah, no, it, it's, a, it's a smooth process for the most part, but that was a long time coming. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time figuring out where our roles were, and we happen to have a complementary skill set that neither of us wanted to believe existed. We both felt we were better at what the other one was doing until we kind of fell into our role. So once we stopped butting heads, which took really about five years of working together to figure out exactly what it was that we were both very good at, I'm more on the sort of finance and strategic end. My father's better uh, sort of in the field and doing some project management. And then we found a way for us to communicate that wouldn't cause us to, uh, to again, butt heads. That was really the biggest piece. And, and that takes time because there's, there are egos at play that just normally part of it. You know, you feel better about saying things to somebody that you know so well that you wouldn't normally in a professional setting. I think my father sent me to my office once, which was, which was odd. <laughs> but um, other than that, yeah, I mean, we really, we really hit our stride sometime probably seven or eight years ago. And, and since then really haven't looked back. Uh, and then we started having faith in each other's abilities and really, you know, experiencing the potential that we always thought this business had. Um, and once we got out of each other's way and then let both of us do what we do, then we started succeeding. And, and, and I think that's, that's always going to be a hard part is, is knowing where your limitations are, especially when you're dealing with those, those fragile egos that come with a family, an Italian family, no less. So, so I'd say, yeah, we're smooth now is the, is the short answer. Well, you know, take some solace in being told by your father to go, go to your office because <laughs> I don't know if you picked up with uh, Jim's opening comment as uh, uh, he was um, showing an interest in his future wife, his future father-in-law sent him out to the rock pile to split rocks, which is essentially what, uh, what I picked out of Jim's opening comment, uh, being told to, to go, go work in the quarry. It was get away from my daughter, go split rocks. So be, being told uh, uh, to go to your office isn't bad. Sean Curry, are you on? Is, is, uh, I'm here, Peter, how are you? Uh, so you're, you're another uh, second generation. Has it been going as smoothly as the Bristols? I'm third generation, Peter. So yeah, 1945 started by my grandfather as a general store and then my dad and then uh, my dad bought it in 1975 and my dad and I became partners in 1995. So okay. third generation, and unfortunately, it will probably stop with me as I have two in college, one that wants to be a biomedical engineer, the other one who wants to be a teacher for autistic children. And the third starting college this August. So uh, they all worked in the business and liked it. I don't know if they had the desire like I had coming out of college to kind of be involved in the business. But it's, it's funny, I, I laugh and the Bristols are such a well-formed family. And uh, it was so true what Ryan said, you know, the family communication, I was very lucky. You know, my dad is my best friend, let alone a co-worker. I miss him when he's in Florida and he's away right now. He's great to bounce ideas off of, uh, but he always let us make the decisions, whether right or wrong, whatever choices we made on venturing into a particular thing and uh, whether it failed or, or, or succeeded, he allowed us to make those, those choices. And luckily now I've surrounded myself with, you know, 50 some odd employees who are much smarter than I am. And uh, I have a management team that, uh, you know, is helping grow the business and do some things that, you know, we never thought possible. So it's uh, it, the family dynamic is, is always interesting. And I like I said, I was very lucky. I know like like Ryan's probably lucky to have his dad and his grandfather. I was lucky to have my dad who taught me everything. I mean, I was signing payroll checks at 21 years old for other people. And uh, my dad was one of nine, so he didn't have that ability. His father didn't teach him much of anything. Besides, he was lucky to be involved in the business um, and bought it from my grandfather when my grandmother took a stroke. I was the opposite side. My father taught me everything from day one. It was he wanted me to know every piece of the business. So it was, it's nice. It's nice to have that family dynamic. 
And where did your father send you when you were acting up or uh, uh, or had a lousy business idea? Uh, it was probably Peter Moore, me acting up. I, I, I can clearly remember a time I was probably 19 or 20 years old. And I remember I was on a ladder in one of the stores and I was probably making a comment like you were wrong and I was right. And uh, I think he put me in my place at that point. <laughs> and uh, it took me a few years after that, probably till about 25, till I realized I probably wasn't as smart as I thought I was. And you know, as you become a parent, you learn with your own children that, yeah, that's kind of what you go through. The kids at some point think they're smarter than you and they figure out they're really not <laughs> sometimes. So, so, so uh, that gives me another opportunity to create family friction here. Uh, Ryan and Jimmy, any ideas that your your father and grandfather have had about uh, running your business? He proclaims now he's sort of like a a, a showcase monarch, uh, all all figurehead, no uh, no power. Uh, but I'm sure he's had all sorts of ideas about how you ought to be running things. Do you dare admit any situations where he's made a suggestion to you on your business and you thought, no, stay on your throne. Don't, don't come down and uh, run the place. <laughs> he was away on vacation and I thought it was a good idea to fill in a quarry hole. <laughs> because we needed more room in the yard. And when he came back, he was not happy with me. <laughs> It, it's as made for a nice yard in the uh, in the quarry. And, uh, uh, my brother Dave manages everything inside the quarry now with the support of my dad. But, um, he and I get along great because we probably meet once a week. If we were elbow to elbow every day, the family business would probably be over. <laughs> But he has more patience than me, so that's why I got out doing the development and outside stuff. And David uh, literally grew up in the quarry. He was on the scale house like Ryan was referring to back at uh, 10 years old. We had, uh, we were getting an inspection from the, um, um, what agency was that? I'm sure. Or Department of Labor <laughs> came looking for him at, at 10 years old uh, because he was working in the scale house at, at that age. And he was running the scale house. Everybody, truck that came in, he'd weigh the truck, write the slip, tell them where to go get their material. And uh, so they tried to write him up. But uh, my dad stood pretty firm on that, that his 10 year old son can, can work. Forget your label laws. Um, so we're looking forward to the next 10 year old we can put in the scale house. <laughs> it's a little easier now to read the readings, too. <laughs> so, Jim, you, you have been a fixture on the South Shore now for almost 75 years uh, in business, uh, going at it with. with uh, uh, starting in the 50s. How's the South Shore changed? How's the South Shore business uh, environment changed? Well, I would say this, Peter, that, that, that is interesting because, you know, if we start back in the 50s, um, Weymouth was a, a rural town. We, we lived uh, at the edge of some woods where... Uh, the boys, uh, mostly the boys, the girls too sometimes, would uh, could go off on a trail bike and ride for miles and, and a, a snowmobile. And we could actually commute to the, I lived on, Ple well, it wasn't Pleasant Street. It was in the middle of the woods. It was called Daniel Street until they decided to build Pleasant Street right through the middle of our house. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, back to that, uh, it, it's changed the uh, communities that are closer to Boston. They're now very much a bedroom towns and uh, there were qu probably quite a few farms still in existence in, in Weymouth, for instance. And 
I don't think we ever made a trip to Plymouth. That was really far away. And uh, probably because the car wouldn't make it be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, uh, the uh, um, on, oncoming of the, uh, the highway system and the rail system and so forth has, has brought um, bedroom uh, people out to our community, the development of the, the air base. Certainly we've got all kinds of uh, housing out there and that seems to be the only successful thing so far. And uh, so I guess you gotta say that uh, um, it's, it's changed quite a little bit. And probably uh, it's made a nice uh, I think Weymouth is trying very hard to, uh, um, keep, you know, have its uh, um, athletic fields, its uh, walking paths, and all of those things preserved so that people can use them and people are using them. And uh, it's kind of the same way. I think they're trying to do a little bit at the base also. But uh, um you really, and as far as we're concerned, to find a uh, piece of land where you can do some housing uh, gets further and further away from the city. And now with the pandemic, uh, who knows what's gonna, how housing is going to go in either direction, but um, we have to be prepared for it. <clears throat> Great. We're coming up on the hour. I could go on for another 30 minutes easily, but uh, we, we try to limit it. But I do want to at least open it up. Uh, we have quite a few people who, who signed up for this. Um, and I'm off on three screens, I think, to see them all. But uh, if anybody has a qu question or a, a comment, or anyone can tell me a family secret where they weren't so harmonious and uh, didn't always come out agreeing. Uh, I'll be glad to, to turn the, um, the floor over to you if anyone has a question or comment before we... Hey, Peter? Yeah. So, this is Susan. Today leader, we're at Rockland Trust. Also. Yeah, I'll be really quick. That was just such a wonderful story. I love history and really just um, loved hearing from all, uh, all the generations. But um, the elder Mr. Bristol mentioned Jack Lamborghini, who was my neighbor growing up. And my father and a couple other neighbors actually pooled about $5,000 together into the Weymouth uh, Port uh, project. So <laughs> caused a little friction, I think, when Weymouth, the Weymouth Port thing, I think there was an initial problem. Um, so a little friction in the neighborhood uh, back then when uh, things didn't go quite according to plan. But uh, it was just uh, interesting because I grew up with the Lamborghini family. Um, and I also wanted to say that I live in situated widow's walk. Come on, you guys come in and build a development. We need some housing and some development around there. So anyway, great story and, and nice to see you all. Love that hearing uh, from everybody. Well, there you go, Jim, you got an invitation to go into a, into a yeah. town. <laughs> Do some more development. People, people like the product that you've been building. So, so uh, Peter, I had, I had a question. There, go hey, ahead. everybody. It's uh, Jared Bell, Mountain One Bank. How you guys doing? Good to see all you. Um, so, uh, my question is more related to you know with everything that's going on this past year. Um, you know, the industry in terms of your guys' development business is, is struggling with, with the cost of labor increasing. I'm, I'm sorry, the cost of uh, lumber increasing. And so, you know, it, it, when looking at new projects and that sort of thing, can you kind of go over just what you're looking at in terms of making sure that you, you're able to still make a profit and, and what uh, kind of, I guess, how you're overcoming these obstacles in order to, you know, have these, these things you know, get, get done because I think a lot of these projects right now are, you know, just not able to produce the same amount of uh, profit margins that typically you would be able to. And so it's um, been a struggle, I think. And I don't know if you guys could kind of enlighten us a little bit on how 
you guys have gone about that and what maybe has been able to allow you to be so successful? Yeah, well, we, we try to go into every project um, with the worst case scenario. Um, pandemic probably wasn't figured into any of them. Um, but, uh, and as you say, what it's done to the cost of materials, uh, lumber has literally doubled from uh, you know, going into the pandemic last year. So we're hoping that as the factories get back online and they're able to get their workforces back working somewhat of a normal schedule, that prices will slowly uh, get back to where they were pre-pandemic. And um, but the, the good news is the market's been kind of crazy. So if you do have something available for sale, uh, we've spent the last couple of years building roads and getting inventory ready. So we're hoping to build a lot of houses again starting this year. Um, and, you know, the market outlook is still good. Costs are up, as you say. Um, but we try to take a long term look at every project that what if. And um, we're certainly in a what if. So, <laughs> um, but. We're in good shape, I think, financially on, on all the projects. So, um, and as my dad alluded to, we, we don't forget how to dig dirt. And that's sometimes what pays the bills on a development project uh, as we're trying to get to the point of, you know, selling the first few homes. So um, it's, it's all those different hats that we wear that, that help us uh, get through the ups and downs. Good question. Yeah, I would, I would just, to tally on at the end of that i would say the density uh, aspect that you mentioned earlier is definitely something that um can help with you know offset rising costs of materials and um we found during the pandemic in uh, obviously initially it was very tough to permit and deal with the towns but uh, a lot of towns have been very good to deal with as of late um, i think they know businesses have been struggling and um i think you know it, being fair going forward will hopefully help you know um with development projects and any other business opportunities that are out there. I think that's, that's what we can hope for. You know? Yeah. The communities are all coming into this hungry for revenues too. Mm -hmm. So um, when you can put a, most of our developments are age restricted. Um, the community we built in Weymouth pays $1.3 million a year in taxes. It's the biggest single entity taxpayer in the town. Um, low, low traffic generator. Uh, less sewer and water use. And as we discussed with Peter earlier, we're always trying to preserve some open space, which smaller lots, you know, smart growth principles, um, it, it helps with the economics of, of the whole development also because we're building less road to get frontage to a lot uh, as opposed to a 200 foot frontage with an acre lot. We might get three lots in that same frontage uh, when you uh, as Ryan alluded to, the density, not so much how many units, but the way they're <clears throat> designed is, is the density to, to try to um, make smaller footprints, put the houses closer together. Uh, we, we are finding that very rarely does someone call and say, I want a three acre lot. I don't want to see my neighbor. <laughs> it's, uh, it's more build a nice community, give them a little clubhouse where they can gather. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, it works. I have a question. Um, I'm a Pembroke resident, and I'm pretty happy to hear about um, the Country Club. How far along is that project? And and uh, I also have been to the Weather Vane, which I love. So you guys are all over the place. Um, but the I know that there was pushback from the town, but I, I think it makes so much sense to to take over that spot. And I think it. If it's anything like the Weymouth development, it would be perfect. Pembroke's a, a great story for us. We went down there and I had people behind me at the first meeting telling me to go back to Weymouth, get out of town. And, well, uh, we're a little grumpy uh, down here. <laughs> by the time we got to town meeting, we had almost got a year in the phone uh, in you know, three months. So we got the zoning change, we got the property released from Chapter 61A, and it was primarily because folks from Pembroke came up 
be they politicians or abutters, toward our community, saw that it wasn't a crazy traffic generator, saw that it was a great tax generator, um, and just said, wow, if we get this and save the golf course, why wouldn't we want it? So uh, it's it's one of those real win-win-win. You know, the town wins, the abutters win, and hopefully we win. But uh, we're, we're getting ready to, we've had the architect down, looking at the big function hall to uh, gut that and redo it. And, you know, we'll do that and then the restaurant. But uh, we're hoping, we'll be starting the permitting filing for the conservation delineation uh, this month. So uh, we, we assembled a few parcels around it the past year. So we went from about 180 acres to we have a total of about 240 acres now that we'll be working with. So that will help us uh, preserve a championship 18 hole golf course. Uh, we'll redo to accommodate the housing. Um, but probably 75% of that site will remain open space and golf course. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? With that, I will thank you all for joining. Ryan, Jimmy, Jim, Dave in the background. Thank, thank you uh, for joining. Thank you for everything you've done for the South Shore. Really going on 75 years. It's, it's really an incredible family story. Jim Sr., long may the king reign. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Peter. I, I, I can't you. forget <clears throat> the queen is still in charge. <laughs> <laughs> That's you. Thank you all. Good evening, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Have a great day. Oh.